IQTI uh, morning talk um, by uh, Professor Shayan Mukherjee um, on integrated photonics for high performance quantum sources and detectors. So that is what he is going to talk about. Uh, I've known Shayan for for reasonably a long period of time, so it goes back to before this quantum thing came up. Um, so Shayan uh, is currently um, a professor at uh, UCSD. And he graduated from Caltech, MIT, and um, and again Caltech for his PhD uh, degree. And he has a master's from MIT. And he's also visiting professor uh, at IIT Madras. Um, so that's that's a, a nice thing uh, that he already has some Indian uh, connection there. Um, so his group is micro and nanophotonics. It's reasonably broad uh, with the title, but uh, he does quite a lot of interesting things, um, uh, you know, uh, in integrated photonics. So primarily starting with, you know, silicon photonics, where his group was, uh, you know, uh, was one of the first groups to demonstrate that you can use this popular silicon photonics platform to do uh, quantum processes, but particularly uh, heralded photon generation and uh, creating nice cavities that can uh, help us in doing this. Um, and right, he also works on optical signal processing by exploiting, you know, uh, circuits in silicon. And lately, uh, he's uh, uh, he's working on lithium niobate based uh, platform, uh, either lithium niobate or a hybrid platform. So, which is very exciting, uh, mixing uh, silicon photonics with uh, a really a uh, a well trusted electro optic material. A lot of interesting things are coming out from his lab, uh, including a recent paper that showed a visibility of near 99 percentage. Uh, you know, uh, so it's it's very exciting uh, time, and uh, that's why we thought we should listen from him. And I would like to thank Shayan for accepting uh, this invitation. And it's a little late uh, in the evening. But still, he man we managed to uh, organize this. Um, Shayan, I will stop here and it's all yours, please. Thank you very much, Shankar, for the invitation. Um, good morning, professors, researchers, students, friends. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to present the seminar at ISC Bangalore. Bangalore is a city that I am actually very fond of. Uh, I lived there and I went to school there when I was a young student, some of my relatives live there now. Um, I'm truly sorry I could not give this seminar and meet you all in person, but I'm glad we can use Zoom or, or, or Teams. Um, congratulations on your new quantum technology initiative. This is going to be an important area of research and training and jobs you know, for many decades. Um, it's a pleasure as Shankar highlighted to tell you about our recent work in this area. Um, we use integrated photonics for certain aspects of quantum optics or quantum photonics. Um, we're in the middle of what I would call an exciting mini revolution when the power of microchip technology is being applied to to various problems in quantum information science using light. The one that I would like to focus on for this talk is um, the things we need in order to make quantum communications possible and simpler to implement and perhaps even implement in the real world. So for something to realize something like a quantum relay, um, we will need you know, several things such as compact, bright, high quality, inexpensive, manufacturable and scalable sources of entangled photons for this you know, local EPR source. Um, we will need efficient low jitter single photon detectors, both for the final measurement as well as for heralding. Um, and we will need reconfigurable low loss switches for single photons and for a variety of quantum states. These are the three things I'll try to talk about in this talk. Um, in addition, there are other components that we need from integrated photonics. We need low loss delay lines um, and there's you know, software issues and timing synchronization and the systems aspects that are 
you know, subjects for longer discussion. But these components that would go into something like a teleportation device or a relay device are actually broadly useful for a wider range of optical systems as well. So when we look at, you know, futuristic quantum information processing or QIP, you know, microchips, we will need lots of sources, lots of detectors, large switching fabrics, and all pretty much working at the limits of their performance. And so, um, you know, similar things will be needed for, you know, quantum simulators or quantum sensors as well. So the building blocks really are the key of making these futuristic visions a practical reality. So let me start with the sources. The type of sources we work on coming from a photonics background are the ones that are based on SPDC or SFWM, that's spontaneous parametric down conversion or spontaneous four wave mixing. These are nonlinear optics processes and they go back to the 1960s. And the basic idea is quite simple. You have a nonlinear crystal or waveguide, or in some cases, fiber or even atomic media. For us, it's mostly crystals and waveguides. You come in with a pump and energy conservation. You generate two photons in this case, a signal and idler. Um, at, you know, let's say if you come in at 775, these could be at 1550 nanometers. And they have various properties. As you know, for instance, one of the properties is a strong correlation in the photon number. There are various papers that talk about the generation rate, um, but the basic idea is that you start with a an initially unpopulated two-mode state in the signal idler basis, and you have some kind of nonlinear Hamiltonian that generates the pair that, that you're interested in. The, the point that I want to make here is that integrated photonics allows us to control the spread in modes that are labeled here by mu or k vectors so that the state that we generate is closer to the ideal. Ideally, all the pump energy should be focused on generating only the mu's and the k's that we actually need and want so that the transition rate, which is the time derivative of this probability, is maximized and the pump is not wasted. And we'll come back to this. Let me just briefly review some of the terminology that we'll use to um, describe the performance of source devices, these you know, photon pair devices. One of the important parameters is CAR or coincidences to accidentals ratio. Uh, you can think of this as basically a signal to noise ratio. And this is a measure of the strong temporal correlations of the pair, because the signal and, and idler are produced at about the same time. And so if you measure them with a start-stop detection scheme, then you should see a very tall peak, which is the true correlation between signal and idler photons. It's kind of shown in this cartoon here. But occasionally you would lose one of these photons or you'd get a you know, detector dark count. And so at a non-zero time difference, you could see an accidental coincidence pair. Hopefully this background is quite low. And so here is an example of a fairly high signal to noise ratio or a fairly high car. There are other parameters of interest um, beyond this you know, coincidences to accidental ratio, especially when we talk about a heralded source what we mean is we want to measure G2 or the second order autocorrelation function. So once we detect one of the two photons as a herald, as a timestamp, the other photon should be a true single photon, which means that if you feed it into a splitter and then look for coincidences, you really shouldn't see any coincidences. Or in other words, you should see no triple coincidences between the herald and both the start and the stop. And so that's a measure of this G2 or what's called anti-bunching. Um, and in our sources, we can usually measure a very low anti-bunching G20, this is heralded um, at fairly low pump powers, but the generation rates in this case are still hundreds of kilohertz or sometimes even approaching a megahertz. And the goal is of course to keep this low, even if the pump power increases and the pair generation rate increases. So there are fundamental challenges here, there are engineering challenges and so on. The third parameter that I'd like to introduce is uh, sort of a simple measure of entanglement. 
what we know about these kinds of sources is basically we know the pump energy. So we don't know omega s and omega i, we know there's some. And we don't know, you know, tau s, the time at which they're created, or tau i, we just know that they're very highly correlated. And so the, the way to sort of explore entanglement in this context, or energy time entanglement, goes back to a proposal by Jim Franson. And it's called the Franson interferometer. Uh, take one of the you know, photons and send it this way, to, you know, to the left. Take the other photon and send it to the right. Um, now each photon can decide in each time slot whether it's going to take the short path or the long path. And then the measurement essentially is again a coincidence-based measurement. But there's something interesting here. If both photons take the short path or both photons take the long path, then the coincidences occur in the same time then. And so these are two events that are indistinguishable and you can play with the phase in each one of these arms that's a non-local effect. And essentially you're gonna map out um, you know, these cosine fringes in your coincidences. And as Franson showed, if the visibility of this interference exceeds a certain number, about 71%, uh, this is a non-classical behavior. So with these three ingredients, um, and there are more, there are other parameters of interest, such as the biphoton spectrum, and there are various metrics, you know, fidelity, purity, concurrence, and so on. But I'll just use these three as a sort of um, roadmap for the, the discussion of the devices that we make. So our work on sources, uh, I will refer you to um, these two papers out of several that we have published um, for Silicon, we have, you know, primarily worked with micro ring resonators that have a, you know, fairly high car. Now it's over 22,000 and a low G2 and a high visibility as well. These are very efficient devices. Um, we don't run them with anything close to a milliwatt that we'd like to get there. Um, but they are very bright because they're resonantly enhanced. For lithium nibate, it's SPDC or a Chi-2 process. And here we use lithium nibate waveguides, thin film lithium nibate waveguides. Um, and, and the car can be even higher, and the G2 is also quite low, and the visibility is very good. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you more details about these in the next you know, several pages. But the reason we're interested in silicon and lithium nibate is that not only do they give good performance, but they're actually reliable robust and quite practical materials. So the basic research that we do in our lab could have implications for industry and for actual usage as well. Of course, there are many other groups working on this. There are, you know, I mean, these are just, you know, some of the many authors um, whose papers are really, you know, the benchmark for this field. So let me start with lithium nibate. As the title of this paper that I, you know, just referenced says, we work with tin film lithium nibate. Um, and you'll see why. But tin film lithium nibate is actually a fairly old topic. Um, it has been studied experimentally since the 1970s. There are many ways of making tin films. Um, the ones that we use um, are primarily based on bonding and etching or bonding without etching your lithium nibate. So you rib load the film with either silicon or some other material. With lithium nibate, um, there is an intrinsic problem of, uh, of index matching or phase matching. This is a well-known problem. Here's a review paper that you know, describes it very well. And essentially, if you come in with the pump at 775 nanometers and you're generating a photon pair at 1550, the refractive indices, this left-hand side of the equation does not equal zero. There's fairly strong dispersion. Um, and so you need a quasi-momentum, which is very conveniently obtained by periodically polling this material, which means you, you periodically alter the crystal orientation. So this gives you a block momentum. And this period lambda here is typically on the order of 10 to 20 microns for a conventional Piplin device. Um, the benefits of a waveguide geometry are that you have higher efficiency, so you could have smaller, more compact devices. And importantly, you have control over the modes. Uh, so it's not a continuum of modes, it's a discrete spectrum. And the combination of these two essentially gives less noise. Uh, so 
and this improves things like car and other properties. Now, many of these are even better with tin film lithium niobate waveguides, so you have lithographic confinement, you know, horizontally, and, and the tin film, which is a few hundred nanometers, gives you vertical confinement. But you can see, you know, where the problem would be, that tin film waveguides have even higher dispersion than conventional lithium niobate waveguides, and so this polling period must be nearly an order of magnitude smaller. And so that's one of the you know, fundamental challenges of working with tin film lithium niobate. So that's what we looked at first. Um, here is an image, what you see here is an image of a bold tin film lithium niobate um, you know, device just before the waveguide was made. This is actually a nonlinear microscope image the dark stripes here are the domain walls between the alternating oriented uh, lithium niobate domains. This is an this is an X cut film, so the arrows literally are showing you the crystal orientation. Um, and here, the required polling period was about 2.8 microns rather than 20 microns. And so, in our lab, we built up you know in situ monitoring methods and tried various ways of polling the film. And we also built up our own sort of you know laboratory microscope based on a you know, TISAF laser. And for details, you can see some of these papers uh, that basically show how we progress through making better quality films. So when you define a waveguide down here, the duty cycle is very close to 50%. And, and we have imaged you know, long waveguides to see and verify what the variations are like. We continue to work on polling, um, on developing polling methods. And so uh, we we're able to pull down to about 600 nanometers in Lambda. And there are some features that actually um, have 200 nanometer features um, and they're stable. There are interesting things that we find from a materials perspective, uh, together with collaborators, when we look at the micro Raman spectra um, and we identify what is the coercive field strength, this was a bit of a surprise to us. It's you know, surprisingly high. And so even though lithium niobate is a well understood and well known material, in the tin film case, um, there can be surprises. But taking these things together, uh, when we look at the waveguide performance for pair generation, we see quite good results. So the pair generation rate or pair coincidence rate can exceed on chip, uh, can exceed about 10 megahertz, with much less than a milliwatt of pump power. So that's convenient for pumping with a diode. If you were to use the same device for second harmonic generation, the efficiency is about a thousand percent per watt. Uh, the G2s are also quite low, up to you know, a few megahertz of generation. We think we can improve on this as well. Um, in, in terms of the coincidence to accidentals ratio or CAR, the product of CAR times PGR is very high. It's six times 10 to the nine, which means that at a CAR of about a thousand, uh, you can get several megahertz of you know, pairs out of these devices. And the highest CAR that we have measured is about 67,000. Right? Um, a measure of visibility, the Franzen interferometer visibility, um, measured in two bases. These are about 99% for the raw visibilities. And one of the big reasons for this is basically the absence of background photons and the ability to control the modes and to control the spectra very carefully. And so this is a, an interesting level of performance that I think, you know, lithium nibate folks would, you know, certainly be happy with these devices. But there are certain constraints. And one of the constraints and challenges um, among many that I'll point out, is that if you have a very efficient device, um, then the phase matching bandwidth can be quite large. Uh, so, he, you know, here's an example. Our waveguides are about five millimeters in length. And so going back to that, you know, delta K equation, you find that the, the signal and idler photons can be generated over more than 100 nanometers of bandwidth. Now, if you were to couple these photons into a fiber, this is wider than the C band and the L band put together. So there'd be no room in that fiber for any other signals, no classical communication signals. And so in most cases, um, most practical applications, we follow the source with a filter that picks out, let's say, 
one nanometer or let's say one DWM channels worth, you know, photon pairs. And that's fine. But what that means is that you're essentially selecting less than 1% of your total generation rate. And that's what I mean by SPDC being wasteful in that most efficient SPDC you know, devices have broad phase matching you know, you know, bandwidths. And in most cases, that's not usable or useful. Um, no material that I know of overcomes this limitation yet. Now you may be thinking that let's use this for micro resonators and people do use SPDC in micro resonators, including lithium libate. But I'll point out there's um, a, a little bit later one of the challenges with, with that approach as well. So let me move a little bit from SPDC and lithium nibate to um, silicon. And here, I mean, silicon is obviously very popular in industry for, uh, you know, our telecommunications, RF photonics, and many others. So you know, it's well worth our time to consider if we can get good pair generation from you know, silicon photonics. And among the many advantages, if you use spontaneous four wave mixing, is that your pump signal and idler can all be within, let's say the C band or the L band. So they're all near each other. You don't need a pump at 775 and filters at 1550. You can use essentially all telecom components for this. And so this field has really uh, you know, grown in interest over the last decade or so. And the early results were, of course, using simple waveguides. Silicon is a very high chi-3 coefficient um, because of its own properties as well as the modal confinement. And so uh, you know, cars of a few hundred were observed at pair generation rates of, let's say, about 100 to 200 kilohertz. And the product of power of PGR times car is good, but it's not particularly high. On top of that, the bandwidth of emission, the phase matching bandwidth is really broad. So if you were to you know, um, narrow this down with filters to about 100 gigahertz, you would lose even more of the brightness. So we've been looking at microring resonators, partly because microrings can be fabricated even by folks in industry through foundry processes and also by us. Um, and we have shown that you can get cars of, you know, about a thousand at, you know, pair generation rates of about a megahertz. So now the, the product of PGR and car is quite good. The bandwidths are narrow. So even if we follow them with filters, they don't affect the source. We're not losing any brightness. And even in this case, the France invisibility is, you know, approaches you know, 98 or sometimes even a little bit higher than that. So these devices have been quite um, exciting to work with. The intrinsic quality factor of the rings is about a million. Uh, the loaded quality factor is 1E5 to give us a photon lifetime of about 76 picoseconds. This is convenient because you can use a um, 100 picosecond, which is 10 gigahertz mode lock laser as a source or even an electro-optic modulator to carve pump pulses into 10 gigahertz rates. And um, because the full width at half max is quite narrow, even if we use filters just to isolate the signal and idler bands, they are not going to reshape the JSI. Uh, and of course, these are very compact and energy efficient devices. Of course, all of these, both lithium nibate and silicon work at room temperature and, in, I mean, and they also work at lower temperatures if you, if you need them to. So here's an example of a transmission spectrum for a you know, silicon microring. The pump is, the pump is uh, close to critically coupled and, and the signal and idler um, have a little bit lower you know, nulls here. Um, it's very difficult. The point of showing this is that it's very difficult to get a clean single mode family spectrum like this for SPDC. SPDC is a CHI-2 process. And so your pump is at 775. So if you want a clean spectrum for resonators um, at 1550, it's going to be multi-moded for the pump. And so even if you were able to find some very complex waveguide geometry that does the mode filtering, you may end up with a custom and non-scalable fabrication process. Whereas in silicon photonics, it's fairly simple and straightforward to get a high quality resonance spectrum.
that being said, there are certain challenges here as well. Uh, the pair generation rate for SFWM is proportional to the cube of the quality factor. And so close to critical coupling, the Q is very sensitively dependent on alpha, which is the amplitude, uh, the amplitude transmission in one round trip. So when the field from just after here makes one round trip around the ring, we describe the amplitude and phase change by alpha e to the i phi. So alpha should be very close to one or unity for a high Q ring. And, and the point here is that standard foundry silicon photonics meant for telecom and modulators, you know, is typically designed for alpha about 0.9. And you need to redesign or at least consider how things should change if you need alpha um, at the third decimal digit. If you have alpha as 0.991, you get a pair generation rate in the hundreds of kilohertz, which is good, but not particularly great. Um, to get something over a megahertz, you really need to get alpha to about 0.999. So this impacts the dopants, the bending radius, the couplers, and so on. So there are a few details even in the silicon photonic design. But, you know, it's possible to design very simple looking devices that, for instance, can do interesting things like resonances at both the O band and the C band. And so you could come in with, um, you know, a pump at either one of these wavelengths. And in, and in both cases, you get, you know, megahertz of pair generation with a car in the several hundreds, over 500, with reasonably good you know, visibility. One of the aspects of our of our you know, silicon microrings is that we incorporate a PN junction across the waveguide cross-section. So the microring centers around here. This is a cartoon of the pump mode. It mainly sits in the middle, but the evanescent tails interact with the doped regions. And so if you reverse bias the doped region on resonance, there's a lot of light here. And so there's a measurable reverse biased photocurrent. It could be in the hundreds of of nanoamps or a few microamps, and that's enough to tell us that the pump is resonant with the device. And so you don't need an infrared camera or some other fancy you know, methods of, of trying to monitor this. And so you know, the ability to monitor the resonance was essential to getting a high signal to noise ratio, or in this measurement, a car of about 22,000 from a silicon photonic device. We can also get cars of about a thousand at a, you know, you know, generation rate of about a megahertz, which is really good for silicon photonics. Now, all of this would be nice, but it would be sort of inconvenient if this tiny silicon ring always needed a mode lock laser to carry around with it. And so, if, you know, several years ago, we asked if it was possible to get rid of the mode lock laser. And using an electro-optic modulator, you can use, you know, continuous wave laser diode, but you need some way of driving the electro-optic modulator with short pulses. And this may be a challenge, but it's possible to use a very simple sine wave oscillator um, and a nonlinear diode. This nonlinear diode has certain parameters such that the pump pulse that it generates has the same full width at half max as the photon lifetime in the cavity. So once the pulse width matches the photon lifetime in the cavity, that's how you end up generating what's called a separable state or a separable GSI. And so this allows us to use simple laser diodes and simple RF you know, sources and also simple electronic components. Much of this could be integrated um, and we really don't have to use very expensive laboratory instruments to generate high quality photon pairs. It's possible to bring that that laser diode on a chip as well. Um, working with Intel a few years ago, uh, we used one of their 3.5 on silicon hybrid lasers to pump our silicon microrings. Now, this was a very hard experiment to do because this is a bare die unpackaged laser. Um, it has no stabilization. And so, you know, getting the narrow line widths to line up was difficult. You know, nevertheless, we showed that this was possible. And so there is a roadmap here for, you know, further practical development and even in, you know, industrial adoption. Um, one of the challenges, though, I mean, even though we have, you know, systematically gone after several of the 
issues with silicon photonic pair generation, there are still open challenges here. One of them is this, in, I mean, so certain applications would prefer to have the photon pair generated at the same frequency, or what's called frequency degenerate. Um, and so in a microring case, you can have two pumps that are separated by twice the FSR or the free spectral range, but you have to find a way to suppress the, the SFWM process from each one of these pumps on their own. And one way to do this is to eliminate this resonance and to eliminate that resonance. You can do this with multiple couple resonators, but um, this could lower the Q. And remember that the pair generation rate is proportional to the cube of Q. And so if this ends up you know, pushing the pair generation rate from megahertz to kilohertz or even lower, that wouldn't you know, necessarily be the best way of doing this. Uh, there could be other ways of getting you know, frequency degenerate pairs, such as using lithium niobate. Uh, so you could do that, use SPDC and you have the pump at 775 and photons at 1550. And so the point is that there are applications in which you know, silicon photonics is a nice and feasible solution. And there are other applications in which lithium nibate or thin film lithium nibate may be the preferred solution. And ideally at some point we'd be able to pick and choose which building blocks we'd use. And there would be processes and facilities where we could you know, bring all the components together. Now that's the dream of the future. We aren't there yet. But in the interest of time, I do want to move, you know, move on a little bit and move from sources to our work on switches and on detectors as well. So the story for switches, there's a need for a lot of um, you know, switches in communication networks, as well as the kind of large scale information processing circuits that I showed at the beginning of the talk. But let's look at a very simple architecture here. Uh, the requirements for switching single photons are that, you know, well, firstly, the bar state or the in to through insertion loss should be as low as possible. For instance, in this loop, you're gonna incur this bar state insertion loss on every round trip. The cross state insertion loss should also be low, but the switch also needs to be fast. So for instance, our desired specifications uh, that the 1090 switch speed should be about 50 picoseconds. Where does this number come from? Well, our photon lifetime is about 70 picoseconds, which means that one time bin is about 100 picoseconds, you know, inverse of 10 gigahertz. So if you want to be able to switch on any, on any given time bin, you need, a, you need switching speeds of about 50 picoseconds. Um, but the typical, I mean, for 10 gigahertz modulators, the typical insertion losses are about 3 dB whereas we'd like them to be you know, 0.5 or perhaps even 0.25 dB for the, you know, for the bar state. And so these are very difficult numbers to meet. The way we approach this problem is by using microresonators, again, in silicon photonics, which would be very scalable if successful. Um, and so here's a microresonator in the add drop configuration. You're looking at the, you know, a, a cartoon of the transmission spectrum. By applying you know, different voltages to the micro disk, we shift its resonance. And so with respect to the wavelength of this incoming photon, you can either bypass the disk, and so in to out in the red case, or you tune this onto resonance, and now this photon is sent to the drop port. So to characterize whether the disk works, we set up this experiment where we have this two by two switch here, and we design a loop waveguide around it. So with one voltage pulse, we take a, a single photon and send it into the loop. And then we apply a different voltage to hold it in the bar state for a controllable number of round trips, let's say two, four, six, eight, and so on. And then we apply another readout pulse to take what's inside and send it back out. So we use this kind of an experiment to characterize the loss and the transition time of the switch. And the dispersion of the waveguide is not really a problem. We're only talking about things in the order of hundreds of picoseconds to nanoseconds. So here's an example of the measurements of, of 
switching these single photons into the loop and reading them out again after you know 400 picoseconds or 600 picoseconds, 800 or you know 1,000. Uh, these amplitudes are multiplied by these coefficients. The precursor is essentially the capture efficiency is not 100%. That would be perfect critical coupling. So some of the input reaches the detector. So let's just exclude this. There are enough points here for us to get the ring down and infer what is the loss on every pass. So looking at these amplitudes as a function of the whole time, we can infer that the slope is 0.72 dB per round trip. We know the length of this waveguide from which we know the waveguide loss is 0.45 dB. And so the switch loss in the bar state is 0.27 dB. Putting that in the model, the switch loss in the cross state is about you know, 0.4 dB, 0.44 dB. And we also measured the 1090 rise time and fall time, and they're under 50 picoseconds. In addition, the signal to noise ratio, looking where the noise floor is, um, is over 20 dB. And this is the case because it's electro-optic, voltage-driven switching of single photons rather than all optic. Uh, which tends to have some sc scattering noise from the strong pump. Also, the size of the switch is just about, you know, 20 microns squared or even a little bit less than that. So this is a scalable and cascadable technology on a chip. Just to compare it with, let's say, the commercial state of the art for two by two, very high speed single polarization switches. This is a package device, of course. But the insertion loss is about three to four dB. The transition time is 100 picoseconds. Um, on chip, we have values of 0.27 and 0.44 dB with a you know, transition time of less than 50 picoseconds. And of course, you know, this is a few centimeters squared. This is a few tens of microns squared. They're both electro-optic and they both require about five to six volts. So we believe that silicon photonics, in addition to generating pairs, could actually be used for routing the photons on chips as well. In terms of detectors, I see that I have about you know, 10 minutes or so. Um, in terms of detectors, we don't make detectors ourselves. You can get single photon detectors from commercial sources or you know, various labs, um, but we do use them with integrated photonics. And I want to tell you about an application of these detectors um, that I think is, um, is actually quite fun and quite interesting. Now you can get you know, photomultipliers in silicon with maybe a thousand cells, so a thousand you know, detectors in a very small area. But the timing resolution, which is what you need for LIDAR, for tomography, and even for quantum measurements, is on the order of several nanoseconds. If you look at SPADs or single photon avalanche diodes, um, here's a histogram essentially of detection events, and there's a sharp peak, which has Gaussian, um, you know, full width at half max of let's say a few hundred picoseconds or a few nanoseconds, but there's a long tail. And so overall, this x-axis is about, you know, 10 nanoseconds wide. You get very similar measurements as measured by one of my students when he did an internship at JPL. It's a very similar looking graph um, for these superconducting nanowire single photon detectors, but the x-axis is over one nanosecond. And so SNSPDs are efficient, scalable, but also very low jitter detectors at 1550. And this seemed very interesting to us. Um, over the last you know, 15, 20 years or so, the jitter of SNSPDs has decreased from about the 100 picosecond scale, which is not bad, to less than 10 picoseconds, which becomes very interesting because the inverse of 10 picoseconds is, of course, 100 gigahertz. And so here are some measurements uh, showing a you know, full width half max jitter. And so these kinds of detectors could serve as, as very good timing markers in certain applications. So to utilize that in an experiment, um, let me skip why that's the case. To utilize that in one of these experiments, we performed, um, we essentially built an oscilloscope in our lab to, you know, to capture modulated optical waveforms with very high bandwidth at very low power. And the story here is that, you know, most of our labs have an, have an 
have some kind of an optical oscilloscope. Here's one in our lab that's measuring an eye diagram. Mm -hmm. So unfolded, this is a sequence of ones and zeros, a pseudo-random bit sequence. Um, and this is a key size oscilloscope. Its minimum detection power is about minus 20 dBm or you know, 10 microwatts or so. And you get a you know, nice eye in a little bit of time. Wouldn't it be nice if we could measure the same thing at much lower power levels? So here's an example of measuring the same pattern. And I'm going to highlight the vertical axis here. The conventional oscilloscope is at about you know, minus 8 or minus 10 dBm. Our oscilloscope is at about minus 112 dBm. So there's a 100 dB difference in the detected optical power. And if you can do this, this opens up interesting you know, applications, such as you know, testing high bandwidth devices before packaging, ranging and timing, detection of barcodes, instrumentation, spectrum capture, and so on. Why is this difficult? It's difficult because if you think about 100 gigahertz electro-optic modulation, which means a Nyquist bandwidth of about 200 gigahertz at 1550, the minimum detectable power uh, is about minus 50 dBm. And if you were to buy an oscilloscope, uh, a million dollar oscilloscope, with extensive averaging, your noise floor is right around minus 50 dBm. But if you stick a 100 gigahertz photo detector in, in front of it, then your minimum detecting power is actually minus 20 dBm. So it's nowhere near minus 100 or minus 110 dBm. So the conventional ways of doing oscilloscopy are not going to work in this context. We need something different. And for those you know, familiar with chemistry or, or even applied physics, we'll, we'll know the technique of time-correlated single photon counting, which basically means in every clock cycle, detect one photon, register its time, so timestamp this, or rather the delta t with respect to the clock, and increment a histogram. So in one time bin, let's say this photon hits the single photon detector, we increment a particular time bin in the next clock cycle, another photon hits the detector, we timestamp that, increment its relevant time bin, and you keep doing this for successive clock cycles. The clock can be quite fast, right? Tens of or tens of megahertz or so. Um, and eventually, the histogram that you generate equals the waveform that's being acquired. You, you can mathematically show this. It's actually a, a sampled version of the waveform, but that's fine because most waveforms and oscilloscopes are generated from discrete samples anyway. And so this is quite nice because it allows us to measure very high bandwidth signals because of the good you know, timing resolution of, of these detectors. Um, at very low you know, optical power levels. And so these are optical eye diagrams measured at minus 100 dBm optical power, um, exceeding 100 gigahertz of analog bandwidth. Um, there are no you know, PRBS digital signal generators with 100 gigahertz of analog bandwidth, so we have to essentially measure sine waves at this point. Uh, and the acquisition time for any one of these eyes is about two minutes. Uh, you know, this was about two years ago. We can do faster than that now. You can also take the time domain trace and uh, take the Fourier transform off that. So signal processing. And so you would be able to do optical spectrum analysis um, at about minus 110 or minus 120 dBm power levels. These are measurements of an electro-optic modulator where the RF waves are you know, 1 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, 20, 30, or 40. And so from this, you can get the, the 3 dB bandwidth of the device, so the roll-off characteristics, and so on. So this is an example not of, I mean, uh, of sort of recognizing that the jitter of SNSPDs has improved to the point where they could actually be used in the laboratory. And um, we envision that there could be other applications in this general context as well including perhaps single photon sources with very low um, you know, probability of, of noise events or broken pairs. This is just one of the examples where I think integrated photonics um, can actually have an impact. So um, I think I'm almost out of time here because I want to leave some time for questions. Um, in silicon photonics, our work basically has been to generate um, high quality entangled photon pairs at 1550 and 1310 nanometers heralded single photon generation. We use the, 
we use the CHI-3 process of spontaneous four-wave mixing, which is not super efficient in waveguides, but it is efficient in these compact microresonators. And we can also use you know, these silicon microresonators um, for fast, low-loss, single photon switches. Lithium nigrate photonics, which is CHI-2, um, can be even brighter than CHI-3 and can lead to higher quality of photon pair generation. But there are you know, certain challenges with fabrication and integration and polling. Um, the benefits could be used at other wavelengths um, other than 1550 and 1310, um, integration with electro-optic modulators or other functionality that silicon photonics could not easily meet. And there are also interesting material science questions in the thin film um, nanoscale waveguide you know, regime where you know, edges and boundaries and surfaces are much more prominent than in bulk. Detectors continue to advance. You can, you, there are many commercial sources for SNSPDs now, as well as advanced SPADs and photomultipliers. Um, so this is an area that's widely used outside of the you know, quantum information science community already. Um, but there are applications even in the laboratory. Um, and one of the fun things that we did was this oscilloscopic capture of these you know, very high bandwidth signals. Um, but there are other, you know, more scientific needs and applications for these for heralding and for actually, you know, implementing feed forward in integrated photonic circuits as well. So let me stop here. I'd like to thank the students and postdocs in my group over the years who have contributed to this work, our collaborators, um, our sponsors as well. And thank you all for listening. I apologize. There was some reason why I can't show view graphs and turn on the camera, but if Shankar will allow me now, then I can stop sharing the view graphs and hopefully the camera will survive. So thank you again. Shankar, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Sir. It was very exciting. Uh, a spectrum of work and perspective on different platforms and what uh, one can do with it. Uh, thanks a lot. And let me sure. open uh, the platform for questions by students. Oh, I see a familiar face. <laughs> it's nice here. Yeah. Hello, and how are you? <laughs> Been? Oh, hi. How are you? Hi. Good, good. <laughs> good to uh, see you. Nice. I'm using Teams from within the web browser, so it looks very okay. odd to me. So <laughs> I realized yeah, that the application, I think that's the reason that you couldn't see switch on the both the things together. We realized because that I, with one minute to go. So I said, let me just present the view graphs and then, yeah. Shailendra, do you have a question? Yes, yes, yes. I have uh, just only one. <laughs> this is fantastic. Uh, I think. See the good, uh, fantastic talk by uh, science. So about this photo detector part, single photon detection, right? So everything is still with the very low temperature. Is still uh, the SNSPD or whether you talk about SPAD. Uh, Sometimes uh, in gas system is very poor in performance or so single photon detector. So people are switching to whether is uh, SNSPDs where the performance is very, but the operating temperature is still very low. Is there any kind of like uh, people exploring onto the room temperature operation or is there any way we can achieve it? Very good question. I think people would love to have um, higher temperature. I mean, it may not necessarily be under one Kelvin, even 20 yeah, yeah. or 40 would be good. Yeah. Um, for the oscilloscope, there are two parts to it. If you're willing to spend a million dollars for a Keysight oscilloscope, you can probably afford a cryostat. But more to the point, I think you can upconvert um, into okay. shorter wavelengths. And it seems that the timing jitter for really state-of-the-art silicon spads is, is actually under 30 picoseconds, which, which, which really surprised me of late. Yeah. And so there may be ways to actually use up conversion. And I mean, you may not get a hundred gigahertz oscilloscope, but you may get some, you know, reasonably good performance. And also for things like, you know, Hongo Mandel measurements, that may be enough. So I think you're absolutely right. Okay. Thank you. Thank good. you. Thank you, Shailendra. Um, I had uh, Arindam's hand up. Uh, Arindam, do you want to go? And after that, uh, Varun can take up. Arindam? Yeah. Can you can you hear me? I yes. 
Okay. Uh, well, I think a, a little bit of uh, my question has been asked just now, but I anyway, just wanted to check if uh, this, well, there are two questions really. First is uh, whether this, uh, the jitter that you show for the silicon uh, detectors of about 100-ish, uh, is, is there a fundamental limit that uh, has silicon detectors uh, of high jitter? Uh, that's a question. And the second question is that, is it possible for the lithium niobate based uh, uh, photonics and somehow integrate that to silicon on a chip? Is there a possibility to extend the technology in that direction? That's it. Very good question. Yeah. So yeah, let me clarify, that was an SNSPD that, you know, so uh, a superconducting nanowire detector that has the very low jitter. The silicon spads that's are about, you know, 30 to 40 picoseconds. And they mostly have to do with the well shape and and the guard ring. And so that may be a longer discussion how to reduce the jitter. But for the SNSPDs, our colleagues at JPL believe that they can get down to just a few picoseconds of jitter. This would be remarkable. So that's to be shown, but they're the experts in the field. So I'll probably refer you to them or the, or the NIST guys. In terms of lithium niobate, you're absolutely right. That's where we are headed. Uh, we'd love to integrate lithium niobate in a small region just where we need it and use the power of silicon nitride or silicon photonics outside. We don't have results to share on that yet, but hopefully the next time, uh, yeah, we'll be able to show something. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, Varun. Varun. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, Shayan. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. Uh, so one question I had was in the degenerate SPDC process you uh, described, right? Like pro probably SPDC is better for generating degenerate uh, signal idler pair. Uh, so uh, my question is that how do you prevent uh, non-degenerate SPDC process from also occurring there and lowering the brightness of the source? You're right. I mean, that is the fundamental challenge. So I believe there are some groups that are trying to essentially um, dispersion engineer the waveguide as well as pulse shape and so the idea there is to essentially uh you know prevent uh, so if you don't just design in beta 2 if you design in beta 2 and beta 4 then you can actually engineer the quasi phase matching and other properties in a very careful way i hinted at that when i said that you may end up with these exquisitely designed waveguides or devices that um, are very hard to duplicate but I don't think there are, so we have seen some presentations at workshops and internal reviews. I haven't seen like a clear slam dunk paper that says this is the one way to get degenerate pairs. I think the best performance that I know of still are the old papers from Paul Quiet and company where they take two crystals um, and they're just brighter and higher quality still. And so um, I think in some satellite experiments, they still use bulk crystals even though they, we'd love to give them chips to use, but they're not convinced yet. So good question. I don't think we have a full solution yet. Okay. And do you see silicon nitride as a promising platform for this kind of photon pair generation in terms of brightness and quality? We did look at that, and I know there are certain groups that are working on it. Um, I think one of the challenges is that um, you the onset of parametric oscillation puts an upper bound on what the pump powers can be. And so I think it's an open question whether the achievable rates at the end of the day, I mean, you can get a very high Q, um, but you may also not be able to stuff a lot of you know, power in it. So I think it's still debatable whether they outperform the silicon devices. And so far, we haven't seen them outperform the lithium nibate and thermal devices. But it's certainly a you know, very... You know, exciting material for frequency combs or for low-loss waveguides, and it would be convenient if we could also use it for sources. So I think we should continue to look at it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, if not, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> uh, Shai, this is about the integration. I think this touches on what uh, Shailendra and also Arindam. Uh, I know uh, into that. Um, ultimately, you want uh, this large number of arrays. If you want to do something meaningful, um, you want to have uh, array detectors at the end, right? So it's not going to be one detector. If you're doing some simulations, you, you're going to have 
tens or hundreds of detectors on the output end. Uh, the, the, the whole reason of bringing it on chip uh, gives it that integration density. However, there is a trade up uh, where your detectors need to be at low temperature and you can either use lithium niobate or uh, silicon. Let's assume that you are going to use silicon. Then you cannot put silicon uh, to low temperatures right? because you are actively using diodes for switching. Uh, and tuning and so on. So in that case, silicon becomes a, a, you know, a, a numb uh, 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 circuit there, right? Reasonably passive. You can't do much with it if you want your detectors to work. So how do you see that if you want to go into so, it? Yeah, this is an important question, right? So let's say if our goal is to build some kind of multiplexed source as an example of an application that people would want, right? So you'd need, let's say, a few thousand sources and a few thousand detectors and a thousand by thousand switching array. It sounds crazy, but it, it seems that's where we'd have to get to for a quasi-deterministic source. Um, in that case, there are strategies now, I think, um, to kind of go about this in a non-fully integrated way where if you can get very low loss couplers, um, then you may want to make the detectors cold and, you know, organizations like NIST and JPL can already get 128 SNSPDs on a single chip and more are being made for these you know, telescope experiments and optical comm. And I think you know companies like SciQuantum and others are already making lots of pair sources. I don't know what the number is, but it is lots. And so very much like the telecommunications community, if we can solve the coupling problems, then it allows us to disaggregate the various components. So that's one you know, possible way of engineering our way out of it. The other way is to find this ideal photonic material, whether it's lithium niobate or you know, you know, some other uh, you know, ferroelectric or non-ferroelectric complex material that does everything. But um, you know, a large number of these materials have come up, ranging from diamond with vacancy centers as a platform to many others. And I think all of this will go on at the same time. But I'd like to make the point that it's really driven by the application. If somebody needs a thousand sources and thousand detectors, uh, the build is going to be very large. And so somebody has to really put in the time and effort to support this. And uh, we have done some studies with our partners for one approach, and there are a few others that are being debated. But right now, I will say we are sort of taking the easy way out and saying uh, we don't have to scale that big. We'd rather implement repeaters and just these teleportation devices that you can stick outside the lab and use them on you know, drones or something of that kind and actually get the word out behind, I mean, outside our own community that these right. things are real and they can right. have some, you know, at least demonstrations. Right. Uh, I have one more question and there is, I, I saw a question in the chat. Uh, the, the other question is on the lithium niobate front. So when you are doing this polling, um, you have to be reasonably far from the field. Um, so your gap between uh, the electrodes, the interdigitated electrodes that you have, perhaps is about, you know, uh, 10 micron or so, something like that. Even more is better for us. Yeah, yeah. So uh, then the field that, that you need, the voltage that you need is also, you know, uh, is going to be high. And it is known that when you have such a high field, you start to see um, ion migration problems. Uh, have you seen that in, is it, is it some, something that you, you have uh, observed? We are worried about it. Um, uh, I don't think people have really looked at it in very great detail in these 10 films yet. So uh, that's one of the reasons we collaborate with these you know, material scientists to do these micro Raman um, and sort of site specific analysis. So we are I looking see. at these. Um, so far, it turns out that as far as the voltage goes, we are an order of magnitude lower voltage than the traditional lithium niobate, right? They that have to pull true. across 500 that microns. Is true. That is true. And so um, I think we stress out the film or the material a little bit less than the traditional folks, but they also bury their waveguides beneath the surface, whereas we are right on the surface. 
Right. So it's early days. I mean, it seems like a nice yeah. result and people would like to say lithium naivet is an old material. We understand it. But I think there's still exactly as you mentioned. I mean, if you want to use these for true quantum you know, processors where the two level states matter, we have to be more careful about what we're doing to the, yeah, the film. Thank I see you. this question in the chat yeah. about you want to um, take it up? Yeah. The, about controlling the noise. I'm not sure what noise uh, is being referred to here. Could there be maybe a bit of clarification? Is it the noise in the generation process or the noise in the switch or the noise in the detection? Uh, Monica, you can uh, unmute and perhaps you can explain that. Ah, the noise in the detection. Ah, so it, for certain types of SNSPD detectors, apparently the dark counts are now in the few per day regime. Um, that seems heroic and it, it would have been unthinkable a few years ago. That's not our work, but you know, folks from JPL and others have really pioneered this. And I believe that's not even enough for what they're trying to do with these dark matter detection experiments. And so I think the detector noise for SNSPDs is almost negligible. Um, if you're using SPADs or photomultipliers, obviously there's order of magnitude higher, um, you know, noise events. But it turns out that the kind of measurement that you do also affects whether the noise matters or not. So like single photon detection versus coincidence versus visibility measurements. And so, uh, yeah, there are some details in whether it matters or not. So thank you very much, Shan. Are there any comments? questions from participants here. OK, I think we most of the folks just, you know, completed the whole session. So <laughs> we started with 38, only three tapped out. Excellent. <laughs> so they were hooked Fantastic. up. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, thank I you think, again, uh, Shankar. Thank you. Everyone. Yeah, I think uh, this is this is excellent. So um, thank you very much, Anne, for uh, taking your time in the uh, you know, enlightening us with uh, all the cool stuff uh, you have been doing and also giving your perspective um, as well. Uh, excellent. Yeah, we really appreciate Vifratu coming and joining our group. Yeah, awesome. So fantastic. Awesome. Let's keep, I, let's I, keep I the collaborations you, going. I hope you, 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 you find him useful. <laughs> so he's he fantastic. Like, he's actually on this talk, so I won't say any more, but we'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll catch cool. up offline. Cool, cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank Thanks you everyone. very much, uh, uh, Cheyenne. Um, okay. Have a nice evening and Great. rest of you. Uh, good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.